Good morning everyone, today we're checking out a brand new video, well kind of a brand new video from Popcraft Studios, was The Hunt for Bobby Blunt. Let's go ahead and check it out. Because if you remember last week we actually checked out the to work harder. of Bobby Blunt. I have to do better. People need me to succeed. These were subconscious thoughts that near constantly drummed in the back of Trey and Fuego's mind. On one level, they had been a huge asset to him in building the career he had, but... Drayton de Fuego, so that's how you pronounce the guy's name. Hm. But that also meant he okay. had a tendency to live his life to the beat of that drum, even when it risked putting his life in danger. Uh -oh. That was particularly true during his hunt for a criminal named Bobby Blunt. Trayton was an officer in the Unitalia Protection Bureau. Being a member of any Unitalia. protection bureau in any country was a massively coveted position, and Fuego's impeccable work ethic oh, had been essential okay. in beating out much of the competition to get his job. He had been lucky enough to be born with the same superhuman abilities his father had, which were a significant asset, but natural skill was far from enough to get you work at a protection bureau. Trayton could spawn True. three floating balls of fire around him of different colors, one green, one blue, and one orange. Green was a healing flame that could speed up the recovery of injuries when held ah. over a wound. Blue was hot but not dangerously so, and from it he could fire projectiles that struck with about the ferocity of a softball. Orange was... So blue is more like the uh, range and keep away. More akin to common fire, and he could shoot beams and balls from that as well though he only used those in truly dire situations. Nowadays, it is common knowledge that 22.2% of people develop superpowers naturally at some point in their life, but that hasn't always been the case. Before that time, many countries had police forces, but as people started developing abilities, it became clear that law enforcement needed to go through a massive structural overhaul. Different update. countries were initially trying different ways of handling superpowered individuals. Some wanted to make their entire police forces from those with abilities. Some wanted to keep them out of law enforcement, and some wanted to try banning the use of abilities countrywide. It was a bit oh, of a scramble in those early days, but the country that ended up making the template, which other countries would eventually mimic, was Sweden. They saw that if people Wait, weren't given Sweden? an opportunity to use their superpowers huh. to help protect others, as any fictional comic book superhero would, then many would just end up becoming rogue heroes without any oversight or accountability. So they built yeah. a new type of law enforcement of system called a Protection Bureau. This organization would enforce laws as necessary, but more so than that, its focus was on, as the name suggested, Protecting, protecting people. That rebrand may sound insignificant, but it drew a lot of positive attention from interested applicants. Oh, this system, nice. of course, allowed people with and without abilities to go through training and apply for positions. Every partnership, squad, or tactical unit also needed to have a balance of both types of officers. The superpowered officers, if there's going to be one with pals, there's going to be one without and so on and so on, referred to as paladins, would be paired up with non-powered officers, called guardians. These pairings would then go through their last year of training together so that the guardians could learn how to work safely and effectively with their paladin and their paladin's abilities. Nice. Positions as paladins and guardians both quickly became some of the most desirable jobs in all of Sweden, as with this rebuilt system, it essentially became like signing up to be a superhero, whether you had powers <laughs> or not. As an extra safety precaution, yeah, paladins would nice. wear a specialized suit that tracked when they were activating their abilities. As soon as they did, it would also start a built-in body cam recording to ensure that they were using their abilities responsibly. This Swedish built I wonder how they do that for people with electrical pals. system proved to be incredibly successful, and within a few decades it had become a worldwide standard, with some countries of course executing it better than others, but with most finding it to be the right path into a future full of superpowered people. Despite the chaos that could have come in this evolution of the world, this system of law enforcement, paired with the emergence of vigilance competitions in which superpowered people fight for sport, meant that most powered people were able to find positive and socially acceptable outlets to use their abilities. Crime rates didn't only keep from rising with the emergence of superpowered people, they actually significantly declined in most parts of the world. But that didn't mean that crime vanished altogether, and the criminals who were still active had to get much craftier and more cunning. Trayton and his partner, crime. Nikki Platten, were tracking one of these cunning individuals, and were having a very difficult time learning anything useful about him. 
Bobby Blunt had been suspected of having built technology for a now infamous company called Mechanine Augmentations, which coincidentally had also run out of Sweden when it was active. The company had built mechanical limbs and extensions for people that gave non-powered people superpowers. Unfortunately, later on it was proven they'd been able to power these augments using cells they'd harvested off recently deceased superpowered people whose bodies they'd grave robbed. And later on from homeless people they yeah. kidnapped and eventually killed for their abilities. Blunt had I mean it still kind of sucks that Bobby pretty much killed the only person he had as a friend. Managed to evade any charges despite suspicion of his involvement and was now doing work in Unitalia. Trayton and Nikki had been charged with doing some investigating into him to make sure he wasn't doing anything illegal in Unitalia. Thanks to a group of local high schoolers that he was targeting, Trayton got substantial evidence that Blunt was indeed doing something very illegal. Highly. He tried to kill these high schoolers to keep them quiet when they learned that he was still using an active mechanine augmentation, granting him abilities harvested from other people. Luckily, the high schoolers had and recently Bionics. made bonds with some of the unique superpowered creatures in Bionites, my mistake. of Unitalia, called Bionites, which granted the kids the same abilities as the creatures when they merged with them, so they used these bonds to protect themselves and escape Blunt before he could significantly harm them. In his battle with the kids, Blunt had essentially confirmed that he'd worked for Mechanine and had some new employer, presumably in Unitalia. He also let slip that at least part of his job was to get footage of people making natural bonds with Bionites being attacked by their creature partners. This made the Averett Corporation a prime suspect as his potential employer, as they developed the bond bands which had been marketed to people for decades yep. as the only way to make a safe bond with a Bionite. Yep. Unfortunately, you can't go after a globe-spanning multi-billion dollar company without substantial evidence. Trayton needed yeah, to find the blunt and question the crook himself. From the moment Trayton got evidence from the kids that Blunt was up to something, he started dedicating every waking second to tracking him down. He was also having many more waking seconds than he should, as he was um. cutting his sleep down to five hours a night. And even then, it would often end up being four <laughs> hours or less, as he'd spent the first hour in bed wide awake thinking about the case. Blunt's history oh, was... Dude, that, that's not going to be good for you at all. You an enigma. Sleep. Trayton and Nikki had gotten permission from their bureau and the Swedish bureau to question some of the higher-ranking Mechanina executives now serving jail time. They were even able to fly out to Sweden for a few days to do this questioning, but unfortunately they got no real answers. Everyone they questioned kept their mouths shut, either acting like they didn't know Blunt or saying that they'd never talk. The closest thing they got to useful information was one of the lower-ranking executives bursting out laughing when they asked for information on Blunt. He said, You've got better luck asking a rock to rat on Bobby than any of us. We all know that Bobby's mama taught him how to deal with snitches. Fuego tried to get this guy to elaborate on who Bobby's mom was, but he immediately shut up after saying that, obviously sensing that even that had been too much info to give up. Trayton was frustrated, and Nikki said that the dude pretty much went from <laughs> good luck to oh fuck, I'm gonna die. The weekend they were entitled to in Sweden should be a good way to clear their heads and rest up for some more home territory investigating. Trayton tried to talk her into bumping their flight to going straight home so he could do more work that weekend, but she wasn't on board. They could have had a nice weekend abroad together, as they were good friends who also liked spending time together socially, as most paladins and guardians did. But Trayton elected to spend the entire time researching, going back to the old Mechanine site to see if he could find any hidden evidence of Blunt's involvement or past. Nikki had a Dude, nice weekend depressed. on her own, but by Monday morning getting on their flight, Trayton was exhausted. Even still, through his overworking paired with jet lag, he was back at work the next day bright and early, and thankfully had a new lead. A public call for information on Blunt had been put out in Unitalia, so anyone with information on him was asked to call the Bureau. A man who'd moved to Unitalia from Boston in the United States a few years ago called in and said he'd been friends with a girl back home named Bella Blunt. She, oh. on a few occasions, had talked about how sad it was that her cousin Bobby had gone down a dark path encouraged by his mother. Um, the man um, said um. he had no idea if this was the same Bobby Blunt they were looking for, as he'd never met the guy in person, but figured he'd give them the information anyway. Trayton and Nikki were ecstatic, especially when the man gave them Bella's contact information. Fuego wanted to jump straight to calling her, but Nikki held him back reminding him what the man back in Sweden had alluded to about Blunt handling snitches. 
there was a good chance that even if Bella was willing to tell them about her cousin, she was doing so at the risk of her own life. Life is hard work. Let Ready Refresh lighten your load. Ready Refresh, essential hydration delivered right to your door. Nikki was right, and Trey yeah, felt a bit embarrassed for not thinking about that. So, before calling Bella, he first got in contact with Boston's Protection Bureau and informed them of the situation, asking if they'd be willing to grant this woman protection if she gave up info on her cousin. They agreed, and then the call was made. The first call they made was answered by a friendly-sounding woman, but as soon as they mentioned Bobby, she said she couldn't help them and hung up. They tried oh. once more, leading with the information that she'd be protected by the Boston Bureau if she told them anything about him, but again, she hung up. Finally, in desperation and somewhat lacking professionalism, Trayton called one more time, saying, Please, Ms. Blunt, wait. Your cousin recently tried to kill three local high schoolers, and we really want to be able to guarantee them their safety. I understand that he is family, and that it may be scary to tell us anything that could get him arrested, yep. but he is putting people in danger. We're just trying to protect our citizens. There was a long pause, but she didn't hang up. Finally, Bella started to talk. She told them how she All hadn't right. seen her cousin in years, but they'd grown up in the same home when her aunt and uncle, Bobby's parents, had taken her in. Bobby's mother ran a small-time criminal organization, and Blunt had followed in her footsteps, while Bella spent more time with Bobby's dad, who was a much more gentle soul. A lot of Bobby's background so was kind. just color that somewhat helped inform them on Bobby's personality, but the most useful lead in finding him came near the end. Bella said that Bobby's mother had always run things out of a basement under a garage, and the last two times Bella had gone to visit Bobby, hoping to sway him off his criminal path, he'd set up shop in his own garage basements. If it was an option, it seemed like that was his ideal setup, emulating what his mother had done. Trayton and Nikki both so thanked common. Bella and gave her the contact information for the officers in Boston that would provide her protection, though she said she didn't need it. She said that Bobby had done a lot of bad things, but he'd never hurt her. Trayton then started getting city and Just building records, trying to find Just every garage in Inner Talia with a basement under it. That itself took days to do, and Trayton barely slept in that time. Nikki noticed how Trayton was constantly exhausted and tried convincing him to stop overworking himself, but he refused, saying he could rest when Bobby was brought in. This guy's gonna end up either passing out and not being a part of the case, or gonna pass out during the case. She tried to remind him that he'd said that about their last case, and the one before that. But her words were just bouncing off him. She even tried <sighs> calling his older sister, Chanel, who he usually listened to. Despite having very different career paths, personalities, and abilities, Chanel and Trayton had always been very close. Unfortunately, when she called him, he just said the same thing about how he'd rest when Blunt was caught. Trayton did know that he needed oh, rest, Trayton. but he had never been one to stop before a job was done. He was also the kind of person who would always help other people out, even in circumstances where he was already overwhelmed with work. On top of that, he told himself constantly that he had one of the most coveted jobs on the planet and needed to prove that he was worthy of it. This was all well-intentioned thinking, but Unfortunately, he wasn't factoring in how important it was to be at your best and well-rested when going up against a dangerous criminal. Exactly! He found a few dozen garages that had basements and had been leased out in the last few months. He started getting in touch with landlords and going to investigate some himself. Finally, he got in contact with a woman who had rented out a space for 50% over her asking price on the condition she'd take cash only and not make the man renting it go through normal application processes. She'd accepted, and all she knew about the man was that his name was allegedly Grapefruit Melancholy, which <laughs> oh, sounded like on. the kind of bizarre fake name Blunt would come up with. Unfortunately for Trayton, he'd acquired this information on a day when he wasn't supposed to be working, so Nikki wasn't in the office and was in fact celebrating her three-year anniversary with her husband that day. Trayton oh, knew he couldn't call her in, but also funny. didn't want to wait. He signed out their bureau car and drove a few blocks away from the garage. He'd even changed out of his bureau outfit, though with some covert bullet padding under his sweater, which also tracked the use of his abilities, not that the That's camera could see good. through his clothes. I he think. walked around the blocks a few times, seeing if he could spot Blunt in the area, before finally going to the garage. The bottom of the garage door was hanging about a foot off the ground when he arrived. He got close and ducked his head down to look in. He didn't see anyone, just an old muscle car, some shelves with tools, and, 
as expected, a door to the basement. As quietly as he could, he pulled up the door enough to roll in under it. He stood up and noticed, as he walked past the car, that there was a bunch of stuff piled in the back seat, but it was all covered by a blanket and the door was locked. He may have taken more time to investigate if he was of sounder mind, but in his exhaustion he ignored it for now and went towards the basement door. He put his ear to it, but heard nothing. He activated the three flames around his body so he was ready, then turned the handle. It was unlocked. He quickly Ooh, opened it and good. looked down the stairs. He couldn't see the whole room from there, but after taking a couple steps down, he could see a desk with a computer on it that had an axe sticking out of it, and water dumped all over it, as if it had recently been destroyed. Aww. Quite a little detective, ain't ya, Asafa Fuego? Trayton just barely spun around in time to see Blunt stepping out of the car, tossing the blanket off of him, and from his illegal augment arm, firing a bolt of green lightning right at Trayton's chest. He fell backwards down the stairs and hit his head on the concrete below. The vest under his clothes had absorbed some of the shock, but he was still twitching and quickly summoned fire from his green flame onto his head and chest, as Blunt waltzed down the stairs behind him. Good luck, you man. know, I gotta thank yous for doing that little walk about my neighborhood before coming in. Even if you ain't got your bureau clothes on, you still got a bureau walk to you. Was real easy to spot. <laughs> Caught it. you on my cameras a couple minutes ago and just barely had time to get ready for company. Trayton rolled over and thrust his hand forward to fling three bolts of fire at Blunt, but he responded with a beam of ice from his augment that dissipated them all to little more than splashes of water. He then shot that same beam at each of Trayton's arms, pinning his hands in ice to the floor. Hand gestures yeah. were the main way Fuego could control his fire's movement, so there was little he could do to protect himself now. Blunt yeah, then good. closed the door behind him. You know, I got a hand that do you. You got closer to catching me than anybody has before. Bro Miz, you ruined it for yourself by coming after me with no backup. You really underestimating me that much, kid? Blunt shot another bolt of lightning right at Trayton's chest. Again, the vest absorbed some of the hit, but it was still like being struck in the chest with a sledgehammer. Oh, he no screamed doubt. out. Yeah, yeah, call out all you want. This place is soundproof. Did you miss that in your little investigations? So I can have all the loud dance parties I want down here without the fuzz coming knocking. He zapped him again. Trayton could barely think. His adrenaline was surging, but it was doing little over the blend of his exhaustion and pain. I guess I didn't need to smash up all my stuff after all. Thought there was a chance I was gonna have to make a run for it, but you really wasn't prepared for a scrap with me at all, huh? Blunt then aimed not. his augment away from Trayton's chest, right towards his head. But you know, it's like my pa used to say. Get on the ground, now! A voice screamed oh. as the door was kicked open. Nikki was there with her gun pointed right at Blunt. My pa never said get on the ground, you clearly didn't know it. <laughs> Nikki slowly walked down the stairs. I'm not playing games, Blunt. Hands above your head and lay on the ground, slowly. He raised his hands as ordered, and slowly started kneeling. Guess you did have some backup after all. Now it's a body. And you know what every good dance body needs? Yeah. Quiet down and lay down, Nikki said as she got to the bottom of the stairs and stepped around Trayton. Every good dance body needs fog machines. Fog Suddenly, machines? mist exploded into the room from eight different pipes, making it almost impossible to see anything. Nikki fired, but had aimed high to ensure she didn't hit Trayton. She was then tackled aside and heard Blunt run up the stairs and swing the door shut. She ran up after him, but he dropped shelves in front of the door on the other side as he fled. Damn she it. was able to push it open anyway, but not fast enough. Blunt was gone. The mist stopped eventually, and Nikki was able to air out the room enough to see Trayton and help get him unstuck. He healed himself up and apologized for not doing better, but swore he'd get Blunt soon. Nikki then gave him a light slap across the face. Thank she you. told him if he wanted to do better, then he had to take a break. She'd left her anniversary dinner to come check on him when she got an email about their bureau car being checked out, and was able to find his exact location thanks to his suit once he activated his abilities. And if she hadn't done that, Trayton would be dead. Oh yeah. Trayton cared deeply about helping people, but now- He will have gone from Trayton to Trait Rod. He was actively uh, hurting the people he fun, cared about by not taking care of himself. Nikki told him that one of the best things you can do for the people you care about is to properly take care of yourself. The people who love you want you to be happy and healthy mm -hmm. and safe, and they don't want to have to be the people responsible for making you that way. 
Being hardworking and determined and wanting to protect others are all wonderful traits, but if you overdo that so much that you harm yourself or make yourself unhappy in the process, then you're essentially circling back around to actively hurting the people around you by making them worry about you, or worst case, even losing you. Exactly. Self-care isn't selfish, it's a service to others. That finally made Trayton take in the message. Not only had he just ruined Nikki's anniversary, but he imagined how heartbroken his mom, dad, sister, and, of course, Nikki, would have been if he died. He finally agreed to start taking it easier. Nikki was even able to convince him to take some <laughs> vacation days coming finally. up. Trayton was a massive Vigilance fan and the Unitalia Invitational was approaching, so he decided to get tickets and take a week to watch the festivities. Even more easily convinced because his celebrity crush, Freya Sparks, was coming to compete in his country for the first time ever. Well before that though, he took two days off to recover and rest. He relaxed, spent some time with his sister, and accepted that if Blunt popped up again, other qualified officers could handle it. Blunt wasn't Hopefully. seen in those two days though, oh. and not again over the next week. Luckily though, getting a hold of his hideout had led to some very useful discoveries. When Trayton returned to work, he was rejuvenated and felt much more calm and present while going through the recovered information. While Blunt had hastily smashed and doused his main computer, there were still some hard drives and files they were able to get access to. They found the footage he'd filmed on the three high schoolers, but found much more footage of three middle school students who also had made natural bonds with Bayunites. Oh, crap. He also had a list of names with contact information and home addresses in a file he'd labeled Folks, they shut up if they don't zip it up. <laughs> After some investigating, oh, Nikki found that about 95% of people on that list had either worked for Mechanine Augmentations or currently worked for the Averitt Corporation. After a bit more digging, they also found a significant link between a name on that list and the middle schoolers Blunt had footage of. Two of the children, Akaru and Junko Inoue, were twins and their father was right near the top of Blunt's list. As much as Trayton wanted to go interview Ooh. the man himself, he knew that this man was clearly at risk already, and if Dai Inoue was spotted speaking to Fuego by Blunt, the illegally augmented crook may just execute the man. Trayton and Nikki instructed another bureau team to go covertly meet with Mr. Inoue, and he had been willing to talk in exchange for protection for his two children and their close friend, Agama Knight, the third boy Blunt had footage of. Mr. Inoue said that he'd been considering nice. coming forward with information about Blunt after seeing his face on the news. Dai did work for the Averitt Corporation, but had recently been demoted when they learned that he was encouraging his children and their friend to make natural bonds with Bayunites, promoting a practice that could lose the corporation lots of money if it became more popularized. Of Dai didn't have any on, hard money, proof money, money. linking Blunt to Averitt, but he had seen the man around the private offices and coming out of some of their most top secret testing facilities, that he'd never been inside himself. Even without having more than his word, this was all still incredibly useful. Plus, he gave them one more lead to look into. That being that Mr. Inoue was quite certain Blunt was involved in a project for Averett that was likely to result in a similar product to what Mechanine Augmentations had been trying to make. Oh, he knew right. little about it, other than that it had been referred to in passing as Project Biomech. Dai Inoue had been a huge well of information, and Trayton promised that he would do everything in his power to make sure that this man and his children were safe and that Blunt was locked up soon. We'll do what we can. But he also finally understood that to do this well, he needed to make time to take care of himself as well. Alright, this actually isn't too bad of a guy. And plus, he's got a pretty unique power set. I like him. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Vigilance, and know that tomorrow another episode is coming out on Chanel, Trayton's sister. There also will be an episode where I'll be drawing Bobby eventually, and while I don't want to spoil anything, know that I have planned out the season finale for Vigilance Season 1, and it is going to bring a lot of different characters together. Oh, I've also man. finally started putting up Vigilance merch on my Teespring store. There's posters, shirts, sweaters, mugs. There's only stuff from a few characters currently, but I am going to be adding more and more. Besides that, if you are enjoying this, leaving a like or a subscribe or a follow or a good review, depending on where you're watching this, is always super helpful for helping the show grow or sharing it with a friend. But regardless of what you do, I hope you're excited for the episode tomorrow.
All right, everyone, that's going to be the end of today's video, and I hope you all enjoyed this. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more. Links to the original will be in the description below, and I'll see all of y'all next week when we flick back on. Till then, this is Fox, signing out. Peace.